MMA odds breaker Frank Trigg, Mark Pavlich, the promoter of Maximum Fighting Championships, and pretty much on everybody's radar because of his his uh, his mouth. Let's just, yeah, let's just put it out there. It's like your mouth. You're you're the, you're the one that you're. I like the way that you do your your promotions because you don't hide anything, you don't hold anything back, and you pretty much say what you're going to do and do it. You know, from a from a real promoter standpoint. What has been the hangups on this next? MFC card. It's like MFC 41, right? Yeah, it's just lots of injuries. You know, it's a it's a state of the state of which MMA is in now that everybody's training too hard in the gym. And, you know, I, I don't even care. Like, for me, it's not like tra- I'm not traumatized by it like I was in the past when I was younger in this business. Um, I, I have a whole different outlook on MMA now in the last, say, year or two years. Oh. And, and like I said, I, my concern is I want to watch violent fights. I want to see people get knocked out. Um, I, that's what I want to see. So I, the, the initial card was really good. The, the card that we put together in the last seven days is better than the initial card just because I, there's just style matchups of guys that had no choice. They had to fight each other. It, it was the closest I ever came to actually canceling a fight card. I've never canceled a fight card in oh. 15 years. And the state of mind I was in, I was like, it was weird. I was locked in my office for about six days straight. I looked like Duck Dynasty guys. And and I was just like, I was just in a real dark, weird place, which I've never been in the MMA world before. Because if I canceled the show, it would make me like everybody else, which I've never done before. And I just I just said, I, I seriously, I don't know, Frank, maybe this sounds extreme, but I swear to God, I'd rather be dead than quit. I swear to God. Yeah. Like, I just, that's how I was taking it. I, I read, said, I was talking to God, telling him, take me. Now, because I would be just like other people that have canceled shows over the 15 years I've been in this business, they cancel them at a whim now, you know, like cancel, can UFC canceled their show in Toronto, canceled their show in Montreal. And I mean, they could do that kind of stuff because they got 900 shows a year. For me, I just, I just thought to myself, if I cancel, that would just put me like I talk crap about all those guys in the past that had no character, no guts to actually work it out. This was the worst case scenario and I saved it. So... What, how much did it actually take? Like, did you have to throw money at some people to make this thing happen? Because as of the, at the moment of taping this interview, we're 10 days away from your next event. And you're talking like the last seven days. So you're talking 17 days before your event. You're trying to save your card. You're trying to save your main event, your co-main event, some of the, some of the prelim cards, some of the prelim fights rather. So like, what did you have to do to make this happen? Did you have to call in favors? Did you have to – I mean, what happened to make this thing work? You know what's funny, Frank? It, was, it really was, was comical because I'm never in this situation. And what I found out was that when I was in this situation, I think people enjoyed it, you know, and that's what that's what kind of stirred me up even more. It's like they kind of enjoyed it. They wanted to take advantage of the situation because I haven't been in this situation in 15 years. And that kind of stuff really puts a like a real crap taste in my mouth when it really does come down to it, because I've always got out of my way to help people, other agents, not so much promotions. But other agents, when they've needed help with things, they've always called me at 3 in the morning. I've been up helping them. And it was really interesting to see when it was time for me to flip, you know, the the switch got flipped on me. How, I don't know, it was like, it was a real six days of like, I really had to say to myself, like, do I love this business like I did 15 years ago? And after this show, I can't say I do. I just... Like I said, there's so much hate and despair in this industry, and I saw a lot of it during those six days. Well, especially to you now, because you have two businesses. You've got Maximum Fighting Championships, the, the fight promotion, but then you also have a marketing company, and the marketing company obviously is making you a lot more money than MFC does, but what's the headache ratio? The headache ratio from the promotion to the marketing company. Like how much, what gives you more of a problem in the, in the overall, not just this last week, but overall what gives you a bigger headache? It's not even close. I mean, the marketing company started a year ago. It's already grossed over a million dollars in the first year. And and <laughs> I don't know, man. You tell me. You know, that's and, – and, and my clients are professional people. Um, it's funny because we've had marketing companies. We've had nightclubs. All these people call us. That's our number one policy with our marketing company. No MMA companies. No clothing MMA companies. No nightclubs. None of that stuff. I, I don't care what you want to do. We will not take that on with nobody. It's much because that becomes a headache unto itself on top of it, you know, trying to deal with all this mess. And then so now you're looking at let's talk about the life the life, you know, span now of MFC. You don't like fighting as much as you did anymore as a promoter because this last week kind of destroyed you. 
What's it going to be like now from FC going in for the next year? I know you have television contracts out there you have to fill, so it's not you can close up shop tomorrow. But access. I'm renewing, I'm renewing with access. Um, I think for like a year, and after that, I'll, I'll let you know. But I, like I, like I said, you know, pe- people want to keep giving less money for things, and and and, and payroll's got to go up. And see, the funny part about this business is I never did it to to, to date ring card girls to be famous. You know, I've been married to the same woman for 28 years. I have children. I did this as a job, a living. I paid my mortgages. I bought cars. I saved money. Um, See, when you talk to other people in this industry, they did it because they thought it was flashy. They thought it was super cool. I was doing it 15 years ago when I I had, if I gave a dollar to everybody, I had to tell what the MMA stood for. I would already be retired sitting in Las Vegas playing tennis with you on Sundays, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's amazing. And I see these new shows coming into business. You know what's funny? We have a show a week before mine in my city. Then that baseball show puts one on the week after mine, right? And it's like it's like their people are purposely, like, they don't understand. Uh, I don't have hedge fund companies running my industry. I don't have, you know, money coming from weird places funding the maximum fighting championship. I do this for a living. And so shows are coming in a week prior to me, a week in the same city, a week after me. And I, and I started thinking to myself, I don't have to do this if I really don't want to, right? I'm not, you know, I don't have investors where I owe money to. I'm not, if I, if I bowed out of the business in a year from now, no one can run their mouth and I owe them money or anything like that. But all these geniuses now that have came inside the mixed martial, I mean, that, that baseball show that was here, Last time they had 300 people in a venue that holds 4,500 people. That's a fact. Call the venue and ask them. So I thought to myself, well, they're not doing it for the money. I, what else are they doing it for, right? And that's how I look at it now. I'm like, well, I'm not going to be the guy that cuts his nose off, spite his face. I like money more than I like MMA yeah. by a million sure. miles. So for me, I, I really look at things now. You're the first person I talked about this with, Frank. Yeah. Um, because I, I, I basically would only talk to you about it sure. because I, people don't understand like this whole mentality thing, but I've been doing it for 15 years. I've seen shows come and go and, and it seems like their motive is not to make money, which that's actually scares me. Like right. I'm not going to compete with people that aren't doing it to make money. You know, that, and that's, that's not just happen, happening to you. It's happened to a lot of us, especially the ex-fighters. We're, we're getting disenfranchised with. MMA as a whole, because we're trying to make a living. We're trying to provide for our family. And, and my generation, the reality of it is 95% of us didn't make any money. You know, the 5% that did, you, you could tour as Liddell's or Ortiz's, those guys made money because they were the champs. They were running, you know, they were making you know tons of money. The rest of us just didn't make it. We didn't bring enough to survive. So even we are getting away from MMA. Like I've, I've, I have one commentating job that I still do. Um, I, if a commentating job comes up that interests me, I'll put my application in. But otherwise, I'm kind of, I don't even mess with it anymore. Because it's 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 becoming the situation where even doing interviews, when I'm doing interviews for MMA Odds Breaker, there's 15 other other websites who are doing interviews with the same guys, and there's guys that have never been in the sport, that don't have a journalist journalism degree, that don't that have, don't know what they're doing, and they're doing it because they think it's a way to get the ring card girls, because they think it's a way to get flash and get known. And I'm doing this for a business. I'm doing this for a love. I started refing. I took Big John McCarthy's refing course specifically so I become a ref and a judge in the sport of MMA, and I'm trying to do it at the professional level. So at some point, someday, I'll be refing for, hopefully you haven't closed shop yet, I'll be you know refing for MFC. I'm working in the state of California right now for, for CAMO, which is the amateur organization. I'm working you know, in, in Nevada for ISKA, which is the amateur organization. And we're not doing it, you know, I'm doing it, that's my, my way to get back to the sport that I love. That's the love of the sport, because you don't make any money doing it. There's no money involved. I'm doing it because I love the sport and I want to be attached to it. My income comes from acting, stunt work, and from interviews. That's where my income comes from. That's it. Is MFC going to become your love of the sport and your marketing is going to be what pays the mortgages and pays the bills? And as long as MFC is even after every show, it doesn't cost you any money and you can kind of justify the time you spend into it. You make a, a couple bucks, you know, as far as I made a little bit of money back, you know, from, from doing this, but you're not making as much money as you used to. Will you keep I, MFC alive? I made a lot of money with the MFC over the years, and and I'm I'm in the one half a percent in the world that has made not money. even half a percent. There's, there's I got to be honest with you. I know the numbers. There are maybe two organizations on access to make money, and yours is one of them. And there's maybe three organizations worldwide that make money consistently. So you're less than a half a percent. 
I agree. And you know what? That's what scares me, Frank, because I'm in an industry where people are coming in to where I am. People are, are overpaying so many things. And, and, and I say to myself, I'm like, you guys aren't doing it to make money. So why am I going to fight with people and be in an industry where it's not about money? Everything, any business I've ever been in in my whole entire life, that's the main objective. Be successful. Have community awareness. Make money, right? Mm -hmm. Treat people properly. If I told you the amount of companies with gigantic names that owe me money in the mixed martial art world, you would be in shock, Frank. I mean, the biggest names in MMA companies owe us money still. Well, let's, can, let's be honest. It, it wouldn't I shock guess. me because we've, because we've talked about it before. It wouldn't shock me because I know the names. I, I know who it is. And it's, it's just flabbergasting that they're not man enough to step up and go, sorry, Mike, we owe you 10 grand. I know it's late. Here's an extra thousand because we're behind. Here, just and be done with it, as opposed to just sitting there on their on their laurels. You know, in, in the mixed martial art world, uh, the amount of money we have owed to us, which is very difficult for us to go after, because we're in Canada. These these companies are in the states, and they're gigantic companies. And I see them talk sometimes on Facebook and Twitter and talk about giving to charity. And I think to myself, and I'm not going to make any derogatory comments about these companies. Right. It's it's not even relevant anymore. But it's just to let people know, like the delusion they they think that MMA is just like the end all of end all. And I, and I try to explain to them the biggest names in MMA. And I'm not talking 10000 I'm talking forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. Like these companies owe us. And it's not one company. It's multiple companies over 15 years. And you just think, and, and you know, it's funny. I looked at my marketing company. And in one year, not one payment of any company that I do business with has been even remotely late. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you... Do you take yeah. sales marketing companies and get them attached to MFC, or do you keep that? Do you keep these completely separate? Not only, not only are you working with nightclubs or, or MMA organizations, MMA you know clothing lines, but you take some of these other companies and go, look, you know, this might be a good a good spot for you to be on my canvas in, in MFC or, or be a part of this somehow in a flyer or something. No, no, I don't. No, I don't completely do that. Separate. I just, I think I, I, there's some sponsors from the MFC that sign with our marketing company. But there is no crossover when it comes to the two. It's very, very, very separate. Um, and, and, I, and I really look at it. And you know, it's funny. I never even intended on having a plan B ever in my life. Mm -hmm. and I was sitting at a restaurant one day with my, one of my best sponsors. And, and, he's, and he's also one of my dearest friends. He came up with the idea for the marketing company because he saw what we did for the Maximum Fighting Championship because we didn't have the budget. Right. like the UFC and Bellator. So, so we, he said, Mark, you should really get on this thing. You, you'll know, you'll do very well with it. Not, not three days later, he calls me into his boardroom. You know, he, he manages the biggest glass company in Canada, oh. Crystal Glass, and he hires me on the spot. I almost, I, I couldn't believe it. And the amount of money they offered, I was like, are you kidding? Like, I had no clue. So he, he came up with the idea. His name is Ken Franchuk. Mm -hmm. he, came up with the, he came up with the idea said, Mark, you'll make millions of dollars doing this. Then he shot, it, he shot his mouth off. He backed it up, called me on the Monday, hired me for his company to run their whole marketing for wow. their social media, commercials, everything. From that company, numerous other companies saw that the biggest glass company in Canada hired us, and then it just snowballed after that. Would you ever do, do you would you ever consider instead of just doing big companies taking like individuals and doing and handling their social networking from a marketing standpoint like fighters that need some help or athletes that need some help with their social networking? No, absolutely not. Never, never. I, and I'm telling you, never. Just like I told people 15 years ago, I'll never have female MMA in that MFC, and that's not going to. And I, I have all respect in the world for female athletes, but I never will have female MMA, and I, and I've never done that. And in my marketing company, I will never take MMA organizations, MMA gear, MMA fighters, okay. never. It's not I thought maybe that the athletes themselves would be a different, not, not necessarily organizations, but the athlete themselves, especially a lot of Canadians that, you know, they come up from these smaller, these smaller provinces that need some help to get seen. Um, I see this problem a lot with Hawaiians because they're, they're so isolated from, the, from the, uh, the mainland that they don't really get that much love, but they're really good and need to be seen. It's getting better now because we have, you know, those guys like Max Holloway and Brad Tavares and, and some other, and, uh, and Kendall Groves and these other guys are coming guys, back out again. Bro. You know, but it's tough. It's tough. And, you know, you get up to Saskatchewan, like, who knows anything about Saskatchewan? So I was thought maybe that you would jump on the athlete and just stay away from the organizations. But I understand your point, though. 
who, who looks anything? Just a year ago, we were talking how Canada was the biggest MMA market. You know, UFC was waving the Canadian flag like crazy. They just canceled their show in Montreal and in Toronto, the two biggest markets, and they canceled it. You got to think to yourself that doesn't if that doesn't scare people that yeah. the, the the nine thousand pound gorilla, the biggest organization on the planet, has canceled their shows in Canada because one guy got hurt or this guy got hurt. If, if that's the difference of branding, if that's the difference of like you would just think UFC would pop the name up and it'd be sold out. That's not the case anymore in Canada, which is which is unfortunate for everybody. Now, how are your shows selling out in Edmonton? And be honest, I know I know that Chevelle's going to get on. But, oh, it's another sold out show here at the Shaw Center. That's that's his job. That's what he's going to do. It's are you still grind. selling out? It's a grind. It's like to the last second. And the difference is, I haven't discounted my ticket prices, Frank, because I said that a long time ago. That it, see, it's still six hundred dollars to sit in the front row. It's still. 300 the row after, 200, 100. The cheapest ticket is 69.95. Now, if I have to turn around and go, okay, I'm going to start selling tickets at $20, I'm leaving. I'm just going to go because I I just don't think it's like that. I, if I start doing that, then I put myself in a league in this city and in, in this country of, well, it's a, just a discount kind of ticket show. It's not like that at all. And so that's the struggle. If I, anytime I said, oh, I'm just going to take the ticket down to 30 bucks for this seed and, you know, I, I would sell out easier, but I, if I, I would sooner have, and I know this sounds crazy. I would sooner have 50 empty seats than give the tickets for $20. I, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's. I, well, no, because you also know the bottom line. If you look at those numbers, if you discount those seats at 20 bucks from, from $70 down to 20 bucks. Now all of a sudden you're looking at well, how much might I actually make on the seats of the venue? I'm barely, I'm barely able to pay for the venue, even though I sold out. I'm still losing a little bit of money trying to pay for the venue at this point. So yeah, yeah. it doesn't make any sense dropping a ticket price down because you. I know how you work, and tell me if I'm wrong. This is this is my assumption of how you work. We've never discussed this off air or on air, and, and you know most most of the fans at home know that you and I talk frequently off camera all the time. My thought process is how you think as you go. If I can get the ticket sales to pay for the venue. I can get the money that access gives me to, to be on to be on, and I get the ticket sale, and I get the 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 if I get you know beer sales or food sales, whatever, then that's how I'm going to make my money. But if I discount one thing, I now have to discount everything that I do, and the pay the pay scale for the fighters is still going up, but I've discounted everything else. So now my profit margin went from five percent to half a percent in one show. Now how am I going to make it to the next show? I don't have anything to left left over for the next thirty days. My my great my my trade has always been getting corporate sponsorship, mm -hmm. and I and my my initial deal with Access TV was excellent. So what what I what I did was I have to leverage. Okay, I have for example X amount of people on the show selling tickets. Mm -hmm. I also have to make ticket deals with those fighters. Now other shows come into my city and give the fighter fifty percent, sixty percent of their ticket sales. I give ten percent, twelve percent max. Right? Listen, you're not my business partners. I have respect for you, but you're not my business partners. I'll give 12%. That's the max I've ever given any fighter. You got other shows coming into our city giving guys 50, 60, 70% of ticket sales. I mean, that's insanity, right? I just, I'll never make it that way. Right. You, you do the math with the corporate sponsors, mm -hmm. you do the math with the ticket sellers, you do, you do the math with the TV money that comes in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you have to, it's very basic mathematics. Don't even use a calculator. Use a crayon, everybody in the MMA world, and write it down, and I'll show you how it's done. But for some reason, people are not doing that. And when they come in my marketplace and they offer a fighter 60% of his ticket sales, pay a guy that usually makes two and two, six and six, then he calls, the kid calls me back and goes, well, I made six and six on that show because that's what they paid me. I'm like, well, that, that's unfortunate because I'm never going to pay you six and six when the UFC's starting pay is eight and eight, right? I mean, yeah. it's, all, it's all relative to the mathematics of stuff. And, and like I said, I'm not going to – I won't last not, – not that I won't last. I can stay in this business forever making X amount of dollars, but I'm not going to stay in this business forever – Selling tickets at twenty dollars—it just not yeah, it gonna just happen. doesn't happen. That's been, you know, then you're gonna give a give a fighter fifty percent of a twenty dollars ticket. You're making ten bucks a ticket. That makes no sense. I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't pay the taxes. You Crazy. know, on that ticket, it's like this that's, is just stupid. That's an interesting word you just said, Frank. Taxes. I want to know how many of these MMA organizations or fighters are even pay taxes, right? Because we we religiously pay our taxes yeah. with the maximum fighting championship. I'm just curious on these MMA shows that just kind of come up. And they, I want to see their tax statements at the end of the year if they're every because 
I don't know where they're getting the money from. That's another question I'd like yeah. to know. That you can afford to go in a 45 seat, 4,500 seat venue last time they were in town, had 300 to 400 people. And how, how is that all working out? Where did that money come from? Right? It's so, so strange. Well, well, Mark, it was great to catch up with you. I appreciate it. We got the, we're going to get a hold of all your fighters for this for this set. Um, I'm glad the show's still going on. And like I said, hopefully, just, just from an ego standpoint on my side, hope you're still running. So at least I can get the one time. Uh, up there yeah. inside inside the ring reffing for you before uh, before you close so the shop. Frank, and I'm going to say it 3,000 times, 4,000 times. I, I don't understand it. I mean, I watch these guys on NFL. I'm a huge NFL guy. Like, I watch more NFL than MMA. There's no question, right? right. I watch more boxing than MMA. I, I feel like I need to tell that to people. I enjoy yeah. watching boxing more than I enjoy yeah. watching MMA now because most MMA I'm watching – they're not trying to win anymore. They're just trying to survive. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just trying to make sure they keep their job the next day because everybody's running in fear all the time. Right. But I really, I really and, I, and I'm going to say it every time that we talk, and I know you get embarrassed when I bring it up, but I cannot understand why I do not see you on Monday night football, why I do not see you on Thursday night football, why I don't see you on Sunday night football. And I'm going to say that till the cows come home because no offense to anybody that's doing it now, but as I watch, I don't see any, I, half the guys that are doing it right now are not even at your uh, your league, let alone you at their league. Yeah, it's it's and believe me, Mark. I bang my head against the wall every time. Like I have to turn the sound down on most NFL. I turn the sound down a lot on on uh, MMA fights because it's, I'd rather watch it at a bar where I can't hear what's going on because it drives me crazy listening to these guys because it's just it's honestly. Not, not in the NFL. In the NFL, they're, they're always very accurate in what they're saying. It's, it's, not, it's just the way they're giving the, their, their delivery and all that stuff is different. In MMA, the information, 90% or 70% of the time, the information they're giving is completely wrong. The information they're saying and what they're doing is, and what, oh, this is what's happening here and this is what's going on here. Like, that's completely wrong what they just said. It doesn't make any sense. Never yeah. once in MMA they change either. When you watch, the shtick is the same all the time. It's mm -hmm. never changed. It's never changed ever. Right. And you watch the shtick that they're doing and at the highest level and there's nothing different. There's nothing innovative. It, they're still talking in tongues to all the you know fight fans out there yeah. because they, everybody knows what an Uma plot is and they don't know. Nobody has a clue what an Uma plot is. They, yeah. they, they're, they're talking in like Pekingese to people that speak English. And it, it just, it's just comical. I was I was talking to a guy the other day about politics, which I know very little about. And I had to stop him and explain to him, hey, you know what, Steve, you really need to simplify this for me because I don't understand. Yeah. I have no problem telling that to people. If I had a dollar for all my friends that really don't watch MMA on the grand scheme of things, when they're sitting at, with me at church on Sunday and they go, Mark, what's an Uma Plata? <laughs> and and so it's like, let's show the lock where he puts his foot underneath the guy's throat and he has it, you know, has it turned out and then he reverses. He can finish into a go-go plot by grabbing his toe and choking him out. It's like a whole thing, but no one knows how to break it down and slow it down because the action is so fast, they're scared to slow it down. So it just, it jumps. So That's, that's the number one thing. We're, they're speaking to people that we're trying to get the fan that doesn't watch MMA, but he right. can't he can't come and watch MMA because he doesn't understand what these guys are talking about. Right. right? It's like, and, and it, you know, I've said it a million times, but no, it seems like no one cares. So I don't care either. But, you know, I, I've even told our announcers at times, you know, about certain things, but that's a no-no too, right? Because, you know, I, I trust me, before I owned the largest MMA organization in the country, I trained fighters that actually fought in the UFC. I know how to set up a cage in a ring I, on my hands and knees doing it. I know, I know how to fly our cars. I know how to do interviews. Um, you know, I, I can outbox probably still half the UFC box, right? Yeah. And I, I think to myself... You know, if I'm telling you something, I'm not telling you out of ego. If I told you, Frank, you know, you should go buy this car. You should laugh at me because I know nothing about cars. But it's so amazing to me when I'm giving just some small suggestions that maybe you should be a little bit more clear when explaining something to right. the fans that have no clue what you're talking about. I invite my pastor, my main pastor, to, to the, the thing the other day. He watched it on TV after. He had about 500 questions about what, why, what are they talking about, Mark? What does this yeah. mean? And what does this mean? And he's a big time hockey guy. He's a big time NFL guy. But he wants to, I want him to get involved in MMA, but he doesn't understand what they're talking about on television. Right. But, right. Yeah, that's how it goes. All right, Mark, we're going to get off the air here, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, man. And good luck in uh, 10 days with your fight. We'll talk to you soon, man. Thanks for having me on, Frank. Take care.